Welcome to another Fridays with Darren session. Today is a very cool one for me because these are two people that I've gotten to work really close with um, and that I really like and respect their perspectives. And um, today we have Darren Golden and we have Joe Cataldo, who are the, the two partners of Golden Solar. And um, I've gotten to sit in on a few conversations in real life between these two. And man, it's, it's uh, ideas are spinning back and forth at a million miles an hour. And so I'm excited to get to bring all of our viewers in on some of the conversation. Uh, I think they're two visionaries who see how solar energy is transforming the future of energy in our country and who have a lot of insights about exactly how that's happening. And um, so they're, they're here today to tell the story about Golden Solar and how they got to working together and, and um, how they see things going in, in solar. Um, so thank you for coming, Joe, and thank you for coming, Darren. Thank you for having Absolutely. me. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah. Cool. So um, a lot of our customers, uh, a lot of our customers have dealt with you individually, um, but for those who haven't or for people who are considering going solar and are interested in Golden Solar, it needs to be really cool for them to get to see the men behind Golden Solar. Um, but just to start off, can you tell us a little bit about how you met and how you decided to start Golden Solar, why you decided to start Golden Solar, um, and, and you know why you decided to partner up, I guess? I remember the day that I met Joe, and I also remember the day that I decided to, to start Golden Solar. So I'll kind of present it chronologically. Uh, so the first thing that happened was, was you know, the decision to start Golden Solar. Actually, I was uh, building a utility-scale solar farm in North Carolina. So 57,600 panels, uh, single axis tracker to uh, power the iCloud basically. So 20 megawatts uh, tracking the sun from east to west throughout the day. And, uh, and I fell in love with solar and I said, this is the future. This is what the whole world is gonna be doing. Uh, but I realized that building uh, solar farms wasn't necessarily where I wanted to be because you're in the middle of nowhere, you know, really remote location. Uh, you're going to build something where obviously land is cheap, so you're not going to be in a cool place like like you know a big city. Uh, so you're so you you know you're somewhere really remote, building something massive, and then once that's done, then you completely relocate to a totally different state. So it's 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 not an easy life. So I fell in love with solar, but I said I want to bring this to like you know day to day regular people and and put solar on on homes. And I did a little bit of googling and I found out what incentives were there, and I found out how much energy was worth and just kind of back of the napkin type calculations. And I said, I think this is feasible. I think this can pencil out. So when I finished that project, I moved back to Miami. That project was in North Carolina and started studying for licensing exams and all that. And the first thing I said to myself is I wanna know how to build solar systems with my own two hands. Because in North Carolina, I was, uh, I was an assistant project manager. So I was kind of on the management side of delivering a, a multi-million dollar project. But I said, I want to understand how to connect the wires, how to connect the structure. I really want to get, you know, down and dirty to, to understand, you know, the, the, the most minute details. And so I looked up solar installation schools in, in South Florida, and, and I found one uh, that was in, uh, you know, Fort Lauderdale area. And I remember I went there and I was talking to a receptionist and I said, I, I'm, I'm going to start a solar company. I want to learn how to do this with my own two bare hands. And he started talking and I mentioned to them, I'm, I'm an engineer. And, and I started asking like, you know, the hard questions. They're like, whoa, whoa, stop. <laughs> you need to meet Joe. <laughs> and he just brought me to Joe immediately. And it went from kind of giving me the brochure spiel of the, of the, of, of the, of the course that is what the receptionist gave me to me and Joe diving way down the rabbit hole and, and, and kind of just, just kind of geeking out, you know, for, for lack of a better term. And, uh, you know, when, when, when two people that are like really interested in like a thing get together, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's really cool. Like, like two, I don't know, like, like, like Star Trek fans, you know, they dive into the yeah. nuances of that. So you, you remember the, the day we met Joe? Yeah, absolutely. Nice. And we talked in that back corner in the cubicle outside the classroom and it was exactly as you described it, just the, uh, you did, we went right down the rabbit hole talking about the future of this industry and how the possibilities were just endless because we were bringing a product that saved our environment and cost less than the prevailing utility costs. And, it, and it, we were selling electricity and saving the environment. So the, our market was anybody who used electricity. It was just, it was cool to 
Yeah. Think so about the a, potential. This was back in 2013. Yeah. And so back then, solar really hardly exists, but for hobbyists or people that were mm -hmm. really passionate and it was our life dream to do a solar system, but there wasn't anywhere near anything near the, the solar industry, uh, you know, that, 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 that we know today. And so, was, so I enrolled in his course to learn hands-on. And I remember there was one instructor for all the basic, like most elementary stuff. But when we got into the classes about the like hard technical, the battery backup systems, the really complicated stuff, those were all taught by Joe. So you know, it was clear to me that Joe was like the brains of, of the operation at, at a solar school and distribution house. Mm -hmm. So from your view, Joe, like Darren said that he was talking to somebody and then they were like, talk to Joe. If, you know, so you stood out to him. Uh, what was it like with Darren rolling up and having all these technical questions? Like, was it were you used oh, to going in the mat about all this stuff with people, or was it refreshing to have like a new no, he was person definitely above the? I mean, he well, obviously a lot above. I mean, he was a special person, to, to very intelligent. Immediately got everything we were pitching, and and just came with this this energy and exuberance you, that's always carried through. Just the excitement and passion about the industry, and he just got it from day one. It was a cool connection right off the bat, uh, and. Uh, um, you had to understand the industry at that time was making this shift from theoretical almost to the practical where equipment prices have been falling dramatically year on year. And what that was doing is opening up wider and wider swaths of the market and fast. So we were at this pivot point when a year or two before we started, it wouldn't have made sense in Florida because the equipment might have been two dollars a watt more than where we were. It just wouldn't have been cost effective. And a year or two later, it, we would have been fully in the swing of it. We 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 really timed it just about right. The the reason I was at a, a training school was because it was a great position to learn the industry and learn all the components at a time where it wouldn't have been feasible to to do as many of the installations in Florida as we are now because the equipment was cost prohibitive. Most of the work we did there at the school was consulting for electrical contractors in the Caribbean where utility costs were a lot higher. So it was these niche applications and these remote sites that were hugely expensive compared to today's product. But it was a great, it, it let me get a year or two ahead of the market in Florida to get my hands on the product before it really scaled. And Darren timed just right to where the Equipment cost was getting cheap enough to really make sense here. And um, like Darren said, I've, we both had this passion to really be the integrators and putting these systems together and making these applications work more than I really wanted to be in a school. It was just, um, I, I was planning on leaving there anyway, right when he came through and it was perfect timing. We had, uh, um, it gave us the background knowledge from both of our paths to really be primed for what we did next. And it was just a really cool launch point. Yeah, and our, and our, and our backgrounds really complement each other very, very well. So, so Joe has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you, you did research on microelectronics. Yep. So, and that's actually how I got uh, kind of keyed in this direction. I had a professor in college and we were sitting around talking in office hours one day. He was a consultant at Samsung at the time or something. And we were just talking about how the, machinery that was used for old TVs and computers was being repurposed for producing these solar cells. And the um, just back of napkin showed me that it was only maybe six, seven, eight years off before we were going to see panels in the sub 70, 80 cents range where they are now that would justify this huge and booming market. And he said, and kind of um, lit the light bulb that there was a market to competitively produce electricity at a retail level. So I left, my degree was like, I said, semiconductor manufacturing, electrical engineering. So I studied making solar panels and making inverters. Didn't specifically use that uh, in the career after, but it, but it put us in a great position to understand the products we sold. The, uh, the, the college also sold equipment and we were one of the first solar edge distributors. And it really gave us a, and, and Gold Solar launched into solar edge right off the bat because we recognized on a, from a hardware perspective, that it was the most elegant architecture that no matter how you, how well you bought the subcomponents or no matter how well you manufactured the different inverter systems, the design of Solar Edge was the least failure prone and the most efficient way to get electricity from A to B and preserve the 
energy harvest of the system. So we just, we were able to, re, uh, my specialty was driving down the rabbit hole on the electronics we were using and making sure that the money we were spending on those components was as efficient as possible. And it was a perfect complement on the structural construction management side because that was uh, not my forte. And Darren's so strong in that space. It was a perfect complement. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, go ahead, Darren. So, so I come into the industry with five or six years in construction management, most, uh, mostly all with uh, general contractors, all, all with general contractors, not, none uh, actually working for a specialty contractor or trade, all working for the GC managing all the trades. So I built schools, auditoriums, uh, some commercial interior build outs. I did a little bit of telecommunication. I did a, I did a home. And then, and then the last thing that I did was 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 a solar farm so i came from the space of managing construction wrapping my head around schedules budgets uh the interesting thing about being a gc is that you're you're managing your, your subs so a gc manages maybe one or two points of contact uh which which then manage a whole company a whole you know which is the the field team of your you know mechanical electrical plumbing painters finishers uh but 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 then you know golden solar we are a specialty trade so we're not managing a company that's managing, but but we're, we're diving you know right into the the actual nuts and bolts of being on the crew with the actual uh, you know on the roof with with the laborers with the crew. So yeah, it's an exciting exciting uh exciting space, but but really it's a, just the perfect kind of blending of of skills. So you so, talked a little bit about Joe. You talked a little bit about what how your roles were getting started. That you really dived into the electrical component side of it and was able to understand the products, you know, to give you an advantage. How have your roles now evolved? What, what, just to give people some context as we get deeper into the conversation, what, what areas do each of you focus on in Golden Solar today? Yeah, so so, so we, we evolved a lot. So right, so at the very beginning, Joe was uh, in, in St. Thomas because that seemed like, like, a, like, a, like a gold rush because the price of energy there was five times what it was here. So while, while he was there, I was here doing some kind of groundwork, getting the brand a little bit off the ground, getting a little bit of a track record. And then uh, basically net metering dried up in St. Thomas. And yeah. so Joe reached out and said, hey, let's reconnect. Let's, mm -hmm. Let me open up the second branch of Golden Soul. I said, definitely, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And so we started out kind of parallel, almost like franchise branches that had the common uh, corporate services of engineering, warehousing distribution mm -hmm. and and then we we just said you know what we don't like the, the franchise model let's just be one big company and, I think what, and, yeah oh say it came from us sharing ideas and constantly talking about the way we were operating a little bit differently and and what we were able to do uh you have to understand, as the industry was, ex was starting and exploding, this was ground zero. We didn't know exactly what was going to work and what didn't. We both, when we first came, when we first started working together, it was a little more autonomous with us working in different regions and trying simultaneously different strategies. Well, both had good ideas. We always shared them with each other, and we didn't know what was going to work out, but we were trying multiple hypotheses at once. So it let us learn from our mistakes and our good ideas quicker because we were trying multiple hypotheses at once in different regions and crossing our notes across and, and what we did is we figured out the good ideas from both and applied them everywhere yeah <laughs> and, uh, yeah so 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 that that was really really cool and you know the, the the industry is referred to commonly by people in the industry as the solar coaster because there's so many variables uh you know one one thing that's kind of funny about how i came to decide to start a solar business was uh, it was a happy mistake, right? Because I went in and I found out that, you know, the large utilities were giving $2 a watt as a rebate for people to go solar. And then you see on your research that the average cost is $4 a watt. So you say to yourself, wait a minute, utilities are given half the cost. The federal government's given 30%. So this stuff is basically almost free. Uh, okay, so it's a no brainer. Well, it turned out that that $2 a watt rebate that I had really decided to to, to, to do this based on wasn't wasn't actually uh, really available. It, it had just kind of dried up. And, and even the last year that they offered it, which was the one year that overlapped of us being in business, it was just all snatched up before. It was a lottery basically, but uh, 
is it, the, the point is that the industry is so unpredictable. I mean, we had a we had tariffs, we had Hurricane Irma. There's licensing requirement changes. What a quick aside on those rebates, just to talk about the industry as a whole. Gold and solar really started at the beginning of what was Florida's sustainable solar industry. Because you had to understand, before that, if uh, there were about five years before we started where FPL gave away $2 a watt. Um, uh, it was five years, once a year, and it was kind of a lottery system where you, you put in your application and they opened up the lottery one day a year and you had to kind of rush to, to get in line to get a serve. Yep. So what would happen is um, nobody would want to build a system until they found out if they got in the lottery or not. And if they didn't get in the lottery, they'd want to wait till next year because for a 10 KW system, it was $40,000, but there was $20,000 in rebate money available. It was all contingent on that. So whether it was intentional or not, it created a boom and bust cycle in the state yeah. where people would sell all year long contingent on getting these rebates. They may or may not get as many as they can the morning of, may get eight jobs, nine. It was not a lot. And then you'd have to build all of those jobs within, I think it was 90 days. I can't call exactly. Other rebates would expire. So what that would mean is you couldn't carry year round labor because they could only work for three months a year. It was right after the rebates. And your sales force would have to sell all year and only get paid the subsequent year when rebates were out. So it made it very choppy for anything to scale. So it was mostly small mom and pop shops, maybe two, three person company where it was jack of all trades. The sales guy was the engineer, was the crew lead. And more than having continuous labor, they had a, they had a shop hand and a, a cousin they brought in. Exactly. <laughs> I don't mean to joke, but, but it, it, and they, they, there were some very quality individuals, but they were individuals. There were two or three people companies here and there, and there may be seven or eight of them that come to mind that were going along before the rebates ended because it was too much money to ignore. Um, so it kind of stunted the industry almost. So the, I know we initially thought it was, we were, we were upset to hear that it was ending because it was a substantial change in the economics, but it really proved to be the launching point of the industry here in Florida because it took the the um, took the cyclical nature out of it that we could actually kind of reach a, a steady state and grow. It also timed out well that the equipment prices dropped to a level where it was uh, profitable for the cut for the or was, uh, there was a real incentive for the homeowner to purchase the system by the time the rebates expired. To me, to me, it's like a leap of faith. You know, it's to me, it's kind of like uh, where there's a will, there's a way. Because I, I got into the industry assuming that there was a two dollar watt rebate, but then again, I assumed that the price of the equipment was way higher. Mm -hmm. So it was more like solar. That's where I want to do. That's where I want to be. And just working with everything that that you know the industry had available. Uh, you know, one of the things we used to talk about is when you're in the solar industry. You don't get to put an ad out for a solar installer. I mean, maybe now you do, but five years ago, you couldn't uh, put an ad out for a solar project manager, project administrator. It didn't exist. Yeah, so you yeah. had to hire just like a good construction worker, a good roofer, and teach them, you know, how to do solar attachments and solar waterproofing. You'd hire a good electrician and teach them the specifics of the solar industry. Or you'd hire a good administrator and teach them about our industry and our permits and our you know, engineering and how to, how to interpret them. And, and it's, it's, you know, that, that statement is so profound because it's not only to, to, to our own staff, but it was also for the uh, authorities, the building yeah. departments, the inspectors, the reviewers, we had to teach everybody if we wanted the infrastructure to Absolutely. exist for us to be able to do this industry. Every part of it had to be built from the ground up. Uh, engineers, lenders, the, the financing options weren't available when we started either. So the diversity of ways to pay for the system it was you had to put all the cash in up front and can convince somebody to go pull out home or you talk to somebody about pulling a home equity line against the asset value you had to fully educate them with the risks and the the uh, associated cash flows for the system there was no bank ready to ready and available to understand yeah the yeah. building departments too oh, we, we had to be able to teach them everything everyone we, we know that we're a permitting company with construction branch oh yeah 
you and I would so much one of us would end up at every meeting sitting there with a reviewer reading through it. And it was not these educating them how to read code and what it means. Well, and, they, and these were quality individuals. They just never seen this equipment before, and there was a lot of nuance to what what's going on still. But they've just gotten more familiar with it now. There was a lot of hand holding in the beginning in education. I think I think you know people are resistant to change, and then that's especially true for authorities. And they and it kind of kind of rebelled against us a little bit at the beginning. I mean, they they sort of had this attitude of like, well, if you were electricians, then you'd know, you crazy solar people. But well, turns it, out we are also. It was a diverse product to install, and they were trying to make sense of what what department to put it in because yeah. there was a there's a very important waterproofing component. So the roofer, the roofing inspectors and reviewers wanted to have their say in it, and they also have. Uh, electronic components that are high voltage and high power. I mean, the, the power in the entire house and it's substantial electrical equipment. You're not installing a toaster. I mean, it's, a, yeah. it's, it's a power plant. So they, of yeah. course, the electrical reviewers needed their say. Um, fire had a lot to weigh in on, obviously, because they need access to the roof to uh, cut into the the eave of the roof or the uh, the peak of the roof to let. Uh, gas exhaust and smoke to exhaust in a fire so they needed access and they needed clearances and none of them had really talked when we started I mean, they were starting to but they hadn't really worked out exactly what they wanted in a cohesive way so it was a lot of um, acting almost as an emissary between internal departments sometimes kind of working through their interfaces yeah but it was great yeah. education we we we, we it was a good it was a good opportunity for us to really position ourselves to be kind of the experts in the state i mean I, I remember in the early days, you got a call from, uh, you know, an insurance adjuster uh, asking what to do about this major uh, fire that, that took place, or I, I don't remember the details, but, you know, you had to lend expertise uh, to, to insurance adjuster. Yeah, but it, it, all of the contingent businesses just had to figure out what that, what these new products meant. Um, and we weren't, I mean, the whole world was figuring out these same issues at the, at the same time. It yeah. was, uh, I remember being invited to meet commercial lenders telling us, hey, look, we have capital available. We need you to tell us how these deals need to be structured. Oh, yeah. Where do you feel like it is now compared to where it was then? Well, so the, the, the finance side is very well understood now. People understand these assets, and there's a tremendous um, – different tranches of, of programs to really categorize most residential deal types. Commercial financing is still coming along a big way. I think that um, still has room to open up. Yeah. The, I think it's fair to say that the equipment prices have stabilized pretty well for a while. That's not Falling like it, it, it for a while it was, it was halving every six months. It, it's stabilized now. There's yeah, no, the tariff kind of kicked it up, and then it just stayed there ever since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of some of the trade policy over the last four years has certainly increased costs, but um, the fundamental, the like the underlying manufacturing costs don't seem like they've changed. They seem pretty consistent now. I think we've gotten the labor to a point where it's at a steady state. It's not like there's I mean, I think the teams are running as efficiently as any labor can be expected to. So things have really started to set, settle out from an operating perspective. I think, I think the, I think Darren, you'd agree that the community is certainly a lot more educated than they were when we oh, first yeah. started. So, so homeowners are you're out, you're able to have a lot more of an intelligent buying decision conversation with people. Yeah. You're not you're not having to spend the first two hours of the meeting teaching them what they should ask. We can jump right, right into the, the bones of it. and They've already heard about net metering. They already know that we're talking about solar energy, not solar hot water heating. I mean, those first- That was days, the first question for years, right? Yeah, you sit down with people and it's like, what's, what are the ABCs? I mean, will you, will, you know, the starting point would be so far back. But, and I think the other cool thing that's starting to evolve now is the battery storage and the and the stabilization components are finally getting here. Because I remember one of the first questions you hear for years was, of course, I'm not going to lose power to hurricane, right? And then you just watch the life drain out of someone's face and they realize that it wasn't, the grid tied system wasn't going to, to give them infinite uh, stabilized power. And that was such a big ask. And it was yeah. only this, this year or last year that that became 
a feasible right. answer, we could say yes to it. It's been it's or, or the answer was yes, but with batteries, but to a very limited extent with a lot of equipment that costs a lot of money. Right. And, it was very and industrial really, equipment. Yeah. It, was a, it was a major not, undertaking. Not user end user ready equipment. No. We did we did some systems out in the like Caribbean and the Bahamas with these giant battery banks and dedicated electrical rooms because the utility costs were four or five times what they are here, and it made sense to justify in very select applications. But to, to think about, uh, we I think we translated it once or twice back here in Florida, and it was not as well received as the power walls are today. It's a beautiful product now, but it's what it's about the long. building departments? Do you feel like you're having to do the same thing with the building departments with batteries as you were with solar before, or have they been quicker with, with batteries than they were with solar? They're quicker to adopt now. Also, power walls are only, or batteries are only an electrical component. You don't have the roofing interface and the fire as much. I mean, it was definitely a learning curve, but it was less aggressive than the original PV days. And, and I bet what well, I bet our counterparty, th there's a lot more, there's a lot more activity now. So there's more dedicated reviewers and there's also more people in the space. And I'm, I'm sure, um, I'm sure um, the manufacturers themselves have done a lot to move that up forward. And, uh, I know Tesla did a lot of strong outreach and uh, supported us greatly. So I think that there's more activity now in the world to move things mm -hmm. along. We were, in the early days, I think it was Darren and I pushing a lot of it through ourselves. And now it was definitely more of a team effort from the yeah, whole state. Yeah. So when did you, when did you both come into business together? Really? Like when did, when did the partnership begin? What year? Well, I, I mean, we, we, we kind of started sharing the vision, uh, you know, immediately the first time we met. I mean, yeah. Joe, Joe came on board the, the very first project that uh, the, the Golden Solar ever had, which was a, uh, we were hired as a labor only subcontractor for another company that acquired that, you know, they got a contract but didn't know how to build it. And, and I remember Joe showing up like, all right, let's build it. Yeah. That, that was that was coconut grove residents in yeah that was so day this one. is like 2014 somewhere in there 13 14 yeah yes yeah. so, so, so golden solar formally incorporated in 2014 yeah okay so that was 14 yeah. and and we were working as a like labor only subcontractor for for another company basically they, they had qualified us uh and then they had us doing installations for them and then we got our license uh, as a solar contractor in August uh, of 2014. Yep. So that makes me wonder, you know, people, as much as the industry is changing and developing, people are, you know, human beings, you guys as people um, have probably changed over the years and grown and your friendship as well. I'm sure you've learned to rely on each other and what each other are good at. Can you talk a little bit about yourselves as people and, and friends and how that has contributed or times that that's been difficult um, for, for the, for the business, um, just the personal relationship there. Yeah, we, we probably, we probably talk for sometimes over an hour, you know, probably a couple of times every day. Yeah. And so we'll bounce around, you know, some like really technical company stuff and then we'll geek out about where we think the world is going with technology in the next couple of years and, and kind of uh, talk about the, the things that give us anxiety and kind of, uh, you know, put, put, put each other's minds at, at, at ease, uh, you know, over the, over the years, uh, you know, we've come to learn what, what each other's strengths are. Uh, Joe, Joe's really been key in, 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 in putting the organization together, which has allowed us to scale to a half a megawatt a month size company. And, and that, that basically completely eluded me because, uh, we just, because from my perspective, it just grew way too fast. And, and then, um, you know, I think I think I've been helpful in, in in keeping the economic model in check, so that we kept our price point at the right place, and um, and, and maybe kind of carried the, the the torch on the vision of the brand of the company and how we should present ourselves and what we should focus on and 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 what we we shouldn't. I mean, one one of the directions. So so Joe was talking about earlier, we got to try out different things like different experiments, and and one of the things that that, that Joe had experimented with was the idea of solar necessarily has to be significantly cheaper than the utility and and that was explored and 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 you know we found out that that wasn't necessarily the direction we wanted to go in we wanted to say we're you know maybe a little bit cheaper than a utility but you get to own your own energy and really emphasize that 
I, I remember there was a point where we were all invited to a meeting with uh, with uh, service finance and sat down with like the CEO and, and he said, you guys are like up and coming stars in the industry. You know, let me give you guys advice. You need to decide what your kind of niche is. Are you the volume company? Are you the quality company? Uh, and, and we said, okay, you know, good point. And then, and then we sort of decided on our personality. I think that's, uh, I think we kind of honed in on identity probably like the third year in and, and yeah. said, okay, we're not going to be the cheapest company in the state. We're not. I guarantee you there's somebody cheaper in the state. In fact, there was a company in, in um, you know, uh, uh, Treasure Coast area that was like 40% cheaper than us. Like yeah. we were looking at them and, and our job was on the floor. We're like, how are they doing it? And then they went out of business six months later. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. You're talking about Bra Bra Bravarda Solar. It, it, yeah. But I, I think it it comes from we identified that the that of course it's a more exciting sale the bigger the the savings are and, and that's an important driver. But that ultimately you, we're entitled to and have to make a fair profit to to be healthy and to be here for thirty years for our customers and it, and it would sink of that equation. Yeah. I think I, I was too theoretical to start. I was coming from the spreadsheet backwards of where it needed to be to to be exciting. And and I, I like we talked about, Darren comes from more of a construction management background and I didn't price in some of the execution risks that are just realistic to this business into any for, contracting trade. Yeah, yeah for, for for me, like in, in, in graduate studies and construction management, less than one on one contingency yeah. <laughs> plan no, for no. the unexpected, you know. You, you 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 have to know that you need some money in for something that you don't know about. That something's yeah. gonna that something's gonna come up, and and so we you know I think we really kind of started from the customer's um, perspective, from the customer's experience, and we said, what does the customer want from us? Mm -hmm. Customer wants quality, yeah. Because we, because at the beginning of the job, the customer agrees on a price, yeah. and that's what the price is, and then we go from there. What's the unpredictable thing to the customer after the price is determined and the scope? is what is the experience going to be like? And so we said, we want that, um, you know, unanswered question to be answered with the highest quality uh, customer service, the most well aware, you know, project managers. And so our project managers, um, you know, came into the industry without knowing a lot about Emerson. solar. You know, some of them have a construction background. Some of, some of them don't. Uh, but but they've always had Joe and myself to draw upon and say, how do I interpret these plans? How how do I respond to these uh, comments from these plan reviewers? And, and we've we prided ourselves in going all the way from the sale all the way to project management, product selection, and and, and years later into uh, you know operations and maintenance of maintenance of the solar systems in giving customers the most honest, most comprehensive, most technical answer that they could possibly get because we really uh, uh, thrive with, with knowledgeable customers mm -hmm. that, that are well-informed. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think, what, I think what, what makes this business a little unique is that it's a construction trade with a financial aspect. I'm, I'm trying to think how to phrase this because when you buy a kitchen or a pool, the contractor presents a cost and you either you want it or you don't and yeah, nobody like, says oh, yeah. show me how i'm gonna break even in seven years by putting that pool there yeah exactly it's not the the, the pool spits out coins every seven minutes and it's a certain like <laughs> uh, <laughs> return, no, I mean, so so it's the pool is worth and resale value what you paid for it because it's an enjoyable feature and it's 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 more anecdotal someone accepted the quote so they were happy with it with us uh, it created a, a different dynamic because you could have a very different construction projects. One house can be substantially easier than another installation, but yet the value of that project is, for, in economics terms, attributable to the the angle of those panels towards the sun and the electricity rates. So it created an interesting dynamic where we had to bid varying construction projects quickly and efficiently, appropriately, because one size does not fit all, but to be able to give our um, sales team the freedom to not get bogged down in too much of a bid process and still be cost effective. And that was definitely, a, I think, a unique hurdle we had to overcome. I think you did a good job with it.
balancing that out. Yeah. And I think we bid thing or we, we developed the skills to to really assess projects accurately up front. I know um, sometimes with a if you're bidding things from satellite only and you're not visiting or um, and you're trying to do too much of a one shoe fits all price model, you you overlook some real challenges in some some of the jobs and uh, can create un unexpected problems for the homeowners in the middle of the project. I think one thing that people can rely on with us is we may we, we might not tell you what you want to hear up front, but we'll tell you the truth. And when you when we when you sign on with us, it's be, we really did assess the project holistically, and we know what we're getting into, and we can perform. We I think we got a great track record with a lot of projects. We've seen everything now. I think. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> is, is there anything? Is there a story that you've faced something during the course of the business that you did not think that you would ever deal with? Um, too many of those. <laughs> I mean, like, what's yeah, something that half comes of the up? Stuff that stands we deal out? with, we never saw. Coming. Yeah, I'd say there's a lot of stories like that, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's a learning process. First of all, it was a new industry, and it, oh, I don't even know where. Well, and, and as a general public-facing business, as opposed to a you know business-to-business, -business, uh, you know, strictly strictly type engagements, you, you just have to deal with you know the the general public's perception. We have to manage expectations. Um, you know, it's sometimes it's it's not enough to just put it all out black and white in writing the contract. This is what you're getting. Uh, it's, we really have to work very hard to understand this is what our customers want. This is what I mean. Sometimes in a sales uh, consultation, a customer will ask a question, and the answer to that question is your question is wrong. What you meant to ask is, you know, instead of instead of can I sell energy back to the utility, you meant can I you know, perform net metering where I'm getting credits for my energy fed back to the grid. So a lot of times we have to hear what the customer's saying and interpret what they what they actually mean to ask and then give it to them in the in the proper correct terms. I mean it's 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 such a new industry to this market, at least in our earlier days, that that we started out, let me teach you the terminology and then explain all the parts, all the moving parts. Well, it's it's definitely a hard line to 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 walk where you're trying to keep the the pitch simple enough to keep people's attention and to not overwhelm them and then to not also mislead on what you're producing because um, I mean the you the quick answer is you're offsetting your car your emissions and you're saving money. And it, are you interested in that and taking on a construction project? Now that you are, let's see if we can actually deliver on that cost point. And let's let us do our homework and see if we can deliver there. Yeah. I think um I was going with that. No, I think um that's definitely a different dynamic. Um I lost my train of thought there. Yeah. Go ahead. Did yeah, you I'm trying, trying to think some some of the stories? I mean, when 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 I got started, uh, I read that uh, this is some of like the hurdles that we'd have that, that we've overcome over the, over the years. When when I got started, uh, I read that in Florida it was sufficient to get a solar contracting license, which would have allowed you to do anything that you needed to in turn both electrically and in terms of roofing work, as long as it was incidental to solar installation. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't replace like a service but we could interconnect our solar system. And that's how it was for the first two, three years of being in business. And then kind of one day, actually there wasn't a sudden, but it started from a few building departments and then it basically became statewide. They said, no, you also need a solar license and you can only do the work on the DC side of the system and you need, and you need an electrical license to do the, the, you know, the interconnection. And that happened immediately. And then all of a sudden, you know, we had to, you know, attain another license for the business. Mm -hmm. uh, we had yeah. Hurricane Irma. Yeah. Oh yeah. Nowhere. Oh yeah. They've been. And then you realize very quickly that your business is distributed across the entire state and has equipment on top of roofs and in people's yards and side yards, and you simultaneously have to secure materials across fifteen or twenty job sites in three or four days. That was fun. We did yeah. no problems, but it was a busy week. One, one, one thing I learned is people will always err on the side of expecting you to perform miracles uh, more so than, you know, on understanding the challenges that you're up against. Uh, you know, it's really common for a 
customer to ask you about battery backup and then you give them a proposal and then they kind of go dark for a couple of months. And then, and then as soon as the hurricane pops up on the radar and it's about a week away, they say, can you get it in now? No, I'm ready. Like, well, Next wait week. a minute. I have to engineer what? it, permit it, procure it, deliver it, install it. Oh, I, and, I, and I definitely think there's an e e expediency to culture in general right now with Amazon Prime and everything that comes with it. Everybody can expect that something can be next day expressed if there's enough money thrown at it. And sometimes that's just not the, the case, no matter how hard you try. And I think Amazon doesn't have to deal with the building department. That's yeah, true. Or, they just yeah. they just deliver things. Yeah. But there's just this culture. The world moves so fast now. You can get a home, you can get a mortgage approved 30 minutes online. You can buy a house online. You could. Uh, get a car so from much, a vending machine. <laughs> yeah, no, just that people's expectations are that something can happen right right now if I want it to. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and and one of our challenges, you know, we're we're as as contractors in the industry, we're known as integrators because we're really right in the middle between uh, an authority having jurisdiction that has their own interpretation from code. And I say that because even though everybody in Florida answers to the same codes, everybody has different interpretations. And in about three hundred or so different building departments throughout the state. 70 in Dade and Broward alone. Um, and, and so even, even within such a concentrated area of Dade and Broward County, there's 70 different building departments, all with their own ideas of how to do things. So we have to really be in between a building department, a utility, which like the building departments, there's multiple utilities, each with their own ideas of how things are done and with their own timetables, which by the way, none of them are constant. They can change the rules at any time. Uh, and, and we're balancing that between uh, you know, our, our suppliers that uh, may have shortages, may change their products. The solar panel, uh, uh, the solar panels are constantly evolving. So yeah. we might sign a contract to find out that that particular panel isn't available anymore. And now it needs to be this panel. No matter how much you forecast that, that's always kind of a moving target. It, Very it, dynamic industry. Well, not to take too much of a long aside there, but part of what makes the panel selection so difficult the time is that it's it's almost baking more than manufacturing because when you really get to the fine tune of how semiconductors are made it's it's gases being released into a uh, compartment across a silicone material and there's and heated as and the ions bake in so the timing and kind of a, chem, a more of a chemistry mix than like assembling legos and a built like a physical assembly product well when, when you're talking about a recipe that's timing and gas concentrations and heat you get small deviations in how those panels come out and that's why you see all of the panel spec sheets are done in batches where you see there might be a 320 325 330 335 series and what ends up happening is they have the most of the panels near the middle of the bell curve because it's what they're they're applying a recipe and they get a range of products so you, you apply a process, you get some on the higher end of the standard deviation, some on the lower and a lot in the middle. So the manufacturers don't always exactly know what they're gonna get when they start the, the cooking process. And uh, some of the manufacturers we've talked to have now in integrated AI into their manufacturing process where they're constantly testing and inspecting the cells mm -hmm. as they come off the line and then going back to say, well, what did we do in that batch? Because these turned out better than the one three seconds ago. and they're actually have AI correcting the temperature and the heat and constantly improving. And I've talked to some manufacturers, sometimes we get a call and they say, well, you know those panels you wanted, they, they turned out better than we expected. So now we have to sell you something different and charge you more. Because <laughs> the, the 325s you were expecting are now 340s because they came out of the oven better. Just, yeah. we were expecting there, there, was, there was one time where we had to actually teach a solar panel manufacturer how they need to sell us the panels. And, and I'm talking about the, the company, flash. what's that? Because oh, they were trying to charge us on the flash test, right? Exactly, yes. exactly. So, so it's standard. Every panel manufacturer in the world offers you plus five minus zero tolerance, meaning a panel might flash for 323 and it'll be rated for 320. So they're, in other words, they're, they're, they're never going to short you. That's the idea. So they'll tell you, we'll give you up to five watts for free, but it'll be no less than than what the the nameplate rating is so so like i said 323 might flash is 320. well we sell based on the flash test it just is what it is there's just a natural variability in, in, in the panels as they're 
coming off the assembly line. And we, we bought from a new manufacturer in, in Florida that, that wanted our business and, and, you know, just buy local, let's be part of, you know, the local market together. And uh, we, we get the invoice from them because, you know, they told us, yeah, we have 300 watt panels and the invoice was like way higher because they were charging us based on what the, the cumulative sum total of what each panel flashed. And we so thought that's not how it's panel done. Panel one was 303, panel two was 307, panel four, we had like an itemized, not that it was a huge deal. Instead of doing the plus, up to plus then, five minus zero tolerance. Yeah, nowadays it's plus, plus, plus or minus, or zero plus five percent batching. So if it's a 305, say you bought a 320, it's a 320, a 321, a 322, 320, up to 5% more than nameplate, and it's somewhere in there. It's same or better than what they've advertised for each batch, and they, they sort them. But yeah. It's, uh, so, you know, it's, it's funny. I mean, just kind of looking back, we've, we've taught manufacturers how to sell us the panels. Uh, there was a major distributor that came down to South Florida. Well, they've always been in South Florida, but they had just picked up solar back in 2016. And we had to teach them everything. Like, no, you can't charge a sales tax. There's no sales tax in solar in Florida. So we, 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 taught, we taught suppliers how to sell it to us. We, we taught manufacturers how to sell it to us. We taught building departments how to, how to review our plans. We taught inspectors what to look for. Uh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty neat to, to be in the, the industry uh, from, from so early on. What would you say for new entrepreneurs that are trying to start a business? Any advice that, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of lessons that you've learned, but anything that comes up for you that you, you know, on the tip of your tongue would say to someone who's thinking about starting a new project? So what I would tell aspiring entrepreneurs, if they were at like the college level, picking a major, I'd tell them, don't study business, study the profession, study something that, that you're really, you know, passionate about. Uh, so if uh, if you want to get into you know construction or engineering or something and say study engineering you'll figure out the business side of it the business side of it's not rocket science but i i, I feel like the majority of other companies that are in our market are, are people that come from a marketing place or come from a business administration place and to to come in with an expertise in business and figure out the engineering side of it seems to me like a lot harder uh, than, than coming in with an engineering expertise and figuring out the business side of it. Yeah. So I'd say, I'd say focus on the technical. You'll, you'll, figure out, you'll figure out how to make business relationships and, and how to market and, and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, you, you talk to the best investors. And one, one thing uh, Warren Buffett's always been famous for saying is stay in your area of competency. You can't really, I mean, you can apply. So first, all of the, the principles or bit of business management are are very important, but you can't properly apply the principles if you don't understand the nuances of the subject you're analyzing. Uh, if, you're, if your assumptions are wrong in your model, the model doesn't matter. And so one of the, I think the big problems, or one of the, one of the best things you can do in any, in any investment is understand the product and the, the object you're producing with the like an expert in infinite precision and that'll make you even simpler back of the napkin models are a lot more effective when you understand what you understand the actual act you're doing with the complete precision and i think as far as advice to a new entrepreneur on that same token learn your product first one thing we did when we started was we said we're two engineers let's make the best solar system we can the absolute be most beautiful product we can and we'll scale the company after like as we go but we can't we have to do a great job for everybody we interact with the best but all of our attention to doing a great job and people will spread the word and that worked out i, I think that's a good don't try to build a behemoth from the beginning get the cart before the horse do one, do whatever you're doing, you're a hair salon or lemonade stand, whatever it is, have a great product, focus on the product um, and focus on just getting that product out the door and the growth will follow. And you, you, before you even realize it, you'll, you'll be growing the business if you're just focused on doing the thing you've set out to do yeah. and doing a good job of it. The, yeah. the rest... You, if, you're, you're, if your product is on point, the market will, will drive your, your growth yeah. with whether, whether you're ready or not. Yeah. You, you don't, 
you don't open a chain of restaurants hoping they'll be busy. You, you come up with a great product and then sell out, make a line around the building. And then you can think about a second location or a third or whatever. Focus on the product first and the rest will follow. I think that's, that was the nature of the first five years. It was, we had a great product. We were laser focused on doing a great job. Yeah. It happened a little too fast, but <laughs> yeah. that was the way to, that was the way to do it. Well, and it's, and it's just being, uh, then never get complacent, you know, is another one. I mean, I mean, we spent, we spent hours on the phone, uh, debating about, you know, this panel or that panel. Uh, we, we, for the most part have been incredibly brand loyal with, with our panels. We've been absolutely brand loyal with our inverters and with our racking. Um, but it's not a blind loyalty. It's, it's yeah. really understanding the, the uh, engineering and, and, and the superiority of the products that we choose. Yeah, it, it's not, we reevaluate constantly. We're not loyal because we like them. It's right. because we, we sat down day one, and I think there were some fundamental principles of some of the companies that we chose, either patents on, tech, like on, on structure or just manufacturing superiority that put them ahead from the beginning, and they've been able to maintain that lead. But it's, it's like you said, it's not a blind loyalty at all. We constantly evaluate. But what we found is that we made some good choices early on and that I don't know how many times competitors each component space have come at us. We've always said, bid, bid your best. We're open-minded. But because we picked the right architectures and the right, the right horses to back, they usually don't win. So we stick with what we're, what we're doing. But we're open to any pitch. I mean, What about the balance out. between... Um you know, there's a, there's a cause happening here in your business as well. You know, it's not just making money. There's also the kind of save the world dimension of it. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs start from that place of an idea they feel like can help people. Mm -hmm. what, can you speak to the balance of keeping your lights on and keeping the business running and, and also prioritizing the mission? Because, um, because you do have, you know, kind of that, that double bottom line of, of serving environmentalism and also preserving and, and, maintaining the future of the company yeah the, the the first contracts that we did in 2015 and, and 2014 were, were based on relationships that we forged with environmental organizations so as a business that's really where where our first relationships came from so we started from our values we started from our ideals and uh, I gave talks at Sierra Club and I, I went to U.S. Green Building Council meetings and and made a lot of relationships there and got a lot of contracts there uh, and then, and then, and then we went mainstream. And I mean, I think we said our product is an environmental product, but it's also an economic product. We realized that this has to pencil out. Mm -hmm. It has to make sense for people financially. That was something that people asked a lot about, like, show me that this is a good investment. You know, we understand that is the nature of this product. And, um, and it, and it took a lot for us to be able to make happen. We had to scale. We had to bring engineering in house. We had to uh, cut out, you know, distribution and have our own delivery drivers. So, so there was a lot of things that we had to do to get there, and and ultimately, um, you know, meet meet all of the different, uh, you know, requests of our of our various different types of customers. So, so we can satisfy both our environmentally driven customers, our economic driven customers. We we want to be a no brainer company. We want to be an easy decision company, and we think that it's, it's a lot easier to get to, to those things, to be able to be not a trade-off, mm -hmm. but get both an economic product and an environmental product and a quality product uh, by having, you know, our engineering backgrounds drive our decisions. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's, there's, in any business, there are tremendous challenges and there's a lot of work that goes into anything you do. And, I, and I've always had a lot of wise people tell me that the, one of the most important things you can do in life is choose something you love because it, it, it doesn't it feel like you never work a day in your life, which isn't, you're definitely working, but, but it's a lot easier to put in those long hours and to, to go through those incredible challenges. Sometimes it knocks you down off your feet. You don't know how you're going to get back up, but it's a lot easier to get back up when you're doing it for a cause you believe in and with good people that you trust and you like, and that, that are also similarly aligned it makes those hard days easier when you're inspired by the right things and i think we're both aligned in that, that, that uh we we both got into it for the right reasons that we wanted to do something that warmed our souls kind of at the end of the day and we felt good about what we were doing both capable people we could have been in many sectors 
but I think there's something about the hard days when you come, uh, when you wrap up a really tough day, but you, you, and you remember that you're doing something really great in the world. Um, sometimes I tell the installers to remember that some of these days are brutal. You go outside and spend an hour and a half in the sun right now. Uh, sometimes I remind them that uh, when you get down off somebody's roof after a day or two of hard work, you've just done something that's going to uh, keep that family cool. You're going to power every movie that them and their kids watch for the next 20 years, every turkey they bake, every light they turn on. You In two days, and they are two tough days, but two or three days, you, you set in motion all of the energy that they're going to use for 25, 30 years. And you bottled that up in a couple of days and left them with that gift to move on and uh it, it's it's easier to do the hard things when you're doing them for the right reasons and there's there's tough days no matter what you do so it, i think that was a big driving factor that helped us that's i think continues to help us succeed is that it gives you the extra the extra fight to fight those battles i like to, to keep some some perspective in mind that uh, you know we're also pretty lucky to to be alive at a time that the that the, that the products actually exist. Yeah. Because yeah. with all the goodwill and determination and hard work in the world, without having you know the products around, this just couldn't have been made possible. So you know I think about my my parents' generation, uh, you know growing up youthful in in the '60s and really the birth of of the environmental movement. Um, they they couldn't have done solar regardless, no matter how bad they wanted to. There, it, the tech did not exist. Yeah. I have up in my garage a 1980s Arco panel that's rated for 80 watt. For I'm sorry, for 30 watts. Yeah, it was made in 1980s and it's rated for 30 watts. And 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 here we are, you know, in in 2020 with with 340, 350, 360 watt panels. So, uh, you know, you know, we're also you know, we're also kind of lucky. And it's one of the things that I think about is every time we buy materials from our suppliers, some of that money is spent on R&D to improve the products. So by being consumers and, and integrators and providers, we're, we're also, uh, you know, to some extent, the driving economic force towards, towards the improvement of, of the technology for, for, you know, the next generations. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's... What about the, the future? You, you know, talking about future generations, I mean, I heard you guys talk about the future. I think it's amazing some of your visions. I've learned a ton, but can you speak to where you see Florida's energy going in the future or what, what kind of the clean energy world looks like? Because I think it's really inspiring. I think the first time I ever heard about some of these ideas was from Joe. Joe's been way ahead of the curve on this. Uh, you, you know, a, a, a bi-directional car charger would allow you to use your electric car to power a building mm -hmm. and so right now people spend a lot of money on on residential battery backup um but maybe they could spend less money on batteries for the home if they if they were already buying the car and you know getting the use out of the car not only to drive from a to b mm -hmm. but but also power a house and so you know there's a complete economy here uh the the biggest limitation of solar renewable energy in general is the discrepancy in timing mm -hmm. between when it's produced to when it's consumed uh it's it's intermittency that's actually one of the biggest challenges for utilities in general is not just producing electricity but producing the right amounts of electricity not too much not too little exactly at all the right times mm -hmm. so utilities have what's called peaker plants which is the most expensive and dirtiest power exactly at six in the evening and at nine in the morning when everybody's home and turning everything on all at the same time. I think that's worth noting that until battery storage has evolved the way it has recently, there has been no such thing as electricity storage. Electricity is not stored. The way the grid functions historically, I mean, before any chemical battery storage is just starting to evolve in the last two or three years, it was an exact matching game of producing exactly what you needed to use this second with no storage. Electricity travels at the speed of light. So it, it was uh, the power companies would create these giant central pr production facilities to produce exactly what the entire population of the state decided to use right now with no input from the power company. 
you decide to turn on your washing machine, your dryer, your TV, you don't want to give them a call and tell them it's coming. It just has to work. And they have to play the game from the other side of the equation with no input, just figuring out how much electricity to make at all times with infinite variability. The law, law, uh, law of large numbers tends to work out where that you don't have to know what any one person Average is doing. Out. Yeah, when you know what a million people are more or less going to do at six o'clock at night, you can make some predictions. But um, but if everybody, if everybody, or you know, majority of people in in Western civilization, and just just talk about the United States, you know, an average household has you know multiple cars, then an average household can have you know a significant amount of stored uh, energy storage capacity. Yeah, I mean, you talk about a I mean, 11, 12 kW system producing on the order of 40 to 60 ish kilowatt hours a day, something in that realm. What's a Model 3? 60 or 70, 80 kilowatt hours? Let's say like 80, yeah. Yeah, so family has two cars, for example. I don't know. That's 160 kilowatt hours worth of energy storage for a home that might consume without transportation for home use. Might use 40 or 50 a day. And the car is 180 stored. You don't use all that energy at night. Some of it's used during the day. But as the grid evolves, I think you get... It doesn't matter if your car is plugged in at home or plugged in at work or plugged in at Publix or plugged in anywhere. It's part of the network. If you can create a symbiosis where some kind of AI or central routing could tell these cars when to charge and when to discharge when plugged in, you have the ability to produce energy from all sorts of sources, solar, wind, uh, natural gas, when needed. And... Um, carry that uh, energy around in the cars. Um, some combination of stationary storage, both utility scale and home. And uh, I think we're just going to see, I think we're going to see the utility. Parking lots full of uh, solar carports. Yeah. Everybody's constantly buying and selling energy. And, and once cars become autonomous, then they're mobile massive batteries that can either transport a person they can transport cargo. They can, uh, you, you know, mobilize stored energy to to a place. And, and there's going to be, a, yeah, you know, like a stock market. You're constantly buying and selling energy depending on, on the buy sell value of energy at that time at that place. Yeah. About and a then, month ago, somebody asked me. They were interested in batteries. Just just somebody that I ran into, and they were, you know, we were just talking about batteries and and storage and renewables, and um, they were real concerned about, you know, how hard it is to make storage now. And obviously, the industry has come a long way, but when you think about creating enough storage to to really solve the the you know duck curve with with solar, it's like it's a real big emerging product and a lot of work that would was going to be done. And they were real concerned about that, and they asked me why you couldn't just build a transmission line. Uh, you know, like down in the earth somewhere and run energy from like one continent where it was light to some other place in the world where it was dark um, and and uh, be able to just, you know, keep keep energy being generated where there's sun all the time and sending it around the world. And uh, I, I've never heard anybody suggest that before. And I have no idea what the realities of that would be like, but they were they were, you know, up against the effort of making all the batteries, they were convinced that that was an idea to explore. So I don't know if you've ever heard of that or if you could shoot that down real quick, but. Well, um, well, that's kind of taking all of the whole concept of the solar industry in the exact opposite direction. So the solar industry is nicknamed D DG for distributed generation because what the solar industry does, you know, at least with rooftop solar, with people putting solar panels on their homes and buildings is taking the centralized generation model uh, of, you know, coal fire plant or a nuclear plant. And instead of them being, you know, I don't know, 50 or hundred megawatts, having hundreds or thousands of 10 kilowatt uh, solar systems on various homes. Uh, so, so that seems to be, you know, going in the total opposite direction, which is highly concentrating uh, a whole continent's needs in, in another continent when it's sunny out. I'm, I'm convinced that it's cheaper and more practical to have, uh, you know, distributed generation with, with complemented with storage. I, th I think the cost of a transmission line 
like that just wouldn't justify um, the the um, the basically the, the cost of shifting that energy wouldn't justify the cost of the line. I think it's just mm -hmm. simply why it's electricity is pretty cheap. When you talk about what it does for you versus your other expenses in life, if electricity is, tra is very light, very fast, very cheap to transport. Um, I think it's cheap enough to produce locally in each market that currently the way the way the grid's currently set up, meaning the exchange between the though I think those economics have already been sorted out. The fish, meaning if it, if it was more efficient to produce Florida's energy in Tennessee, it would already be done hmm. it, because that that challenge has already been worked out between hydroelectric, natural gas, nuclear, coal. The, those production nexuses have already been spread based on local resources and the grids established to trade where necessary. Where, where things have settled out now, I think the differences in cost are minor enough that it's cheaper to, uh, I don't see, I don't see the cost advantage there. I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, but another thing is you have to observe that the world is moving towards uh, uh, electrification of tra transportation. Yeah. And what's so cool here is, you know, as that happens and as the world moves towards, you know, renewable energy, you know, you recognize that the limitations of renewable energy is, are the need for storage and the limitations of the electrification of transportation is where is all this energy production going to come from if we move from you know fossil fuels to electricity and the beautiful thing here is that the problem of one is the solution to the other so when you talk about having the ability to to, to do uh, bidirectional charging with a car that means that you can use your car to take your excess solar power mm -hmm. and then power your house at night mm -hmm. and this when will you, work on a great scale and when you think about the the cost of electric cars has fallen in line with uh, with traditional vehicles. So if your car currently serves the function of being your car and it's cost competitive in that right alone, if it also serves as your battery, it's your mm -hmm. one step ahead. Because if you go the other way and say, well, my energy storage should cost me thirty dollars a month, forty dollars, whatever, capitalized value of twenty or thirty thousand dollars to just store energy. And I say, well, this, this battery also has leather seats and a steering wheel. Um, <laughs> the car portion might only be 20 or 30,000 if the batteries do Anyway, the car, the electric cars of the future are serving both purposes for a competitive price and the synergy is phenomenal. Right. Um, I think we're just going to see the utility model shift because right now the utility has the job of producing electricity, getting it from their power plant to you and when you need it we'll see the business segment where there's going to be an entity with the, the utilities are well positioned to be that distrib distribution company, getting it from A to B and from now to later. But I think we'll start seeing independent producers and independent storage units, whether that's vehicles or stock or park storage, like Darren described earlier, where there'll be a network of buy sell transactions operated by some AI or some central algorithm to broker based on independent sources. And what will happen is you'll have um, the grid will still serve to move electricity from one place to another, and you'll have independent entities evaluating internally whether it's profitable to take energy from the grid, store it, deploy it later for use or for just brokering. So you talk about virtual power plants, mm -hmm. Darren, and some people are already installing Power, you know, a lot of people, especially leading up to hurricane season, are installing Powerwall, and we could see that. W would you agree? You feel like that'll take on at some point in the future an additional benefit for people that they can take place in the storage market. And so one of the one of the things that's so cool about technology these days is the fact that you 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 buy certain products, expecting a certain function out of them. They serve that function, and then a few years pass. And then, and then you come to find out that they also serve more functions. And you, all of a sudden, you invest a certain amount of money in, into products based on certain expectations, but they ended up, uh, you, you know, getting all these extra functions built into them. I mean, as a as a Tesla Model Three owner, um, you know, I've seen that with 
you know, steady updates on the car. Um, I think that the first challenge for electric car makers was to prove that they are, you know, at par or, or better and better than, uh, you know, combustion engine cars. And so until they were able to demonstrate that, it would be, uh, you, you know, counterproductive to prove that they can do more things such as uh, back feed power into, into a building, but, but, but they can. Right. So, but so the first thing is that they had to prove that they're that they're better at being cars. And now that we know that they're better at being cars, we can throw more tasks on top of them, like back feeding power in, into into buildings. The same is true for residential batteries. So, the first thing residential batteries had to prove is that they really are effective at backing up uh, loads. That they can be better than a generator. Right. So an electric car has to be better than a combustion engine. A residential battery plus solar has to be better than a generator. And, and once it can prove that, and once that's a given, just like it's a given that electric cars are better than combustion engines, the next thing is what else can you do with, with a residential battery? And you know, I think one of, those, one of the answers to that question is, is a virtual power plant. So the idea of a virtual power plant is being able to, uh, or, or utilities being able to tap in to the batteries to feed the house, not during a power outage, but during times of peak demand to alleviate um, the, the, the peak needs, uh, you know, the peaks of the duck herd, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and hence, you know, alleviating the dirtiest and most expensive energy uh, in, in those peaker plants. The, the, the reason the peaker plants are so, you know, it's such expensive energy is because it's, you're turning it on and off mm -hmm. as needed. Well, I you're think turning on and off as needed, whereas your nuclear power plants are just steady baseline. So it's more expensive to turn on energy on and off than it is to just have it humming. And so if, you know, uh, distributed power walls, distributed residential battery backup can be uh, the source of power for, for, for homes, not during an outage, also during an outage, but also during those peak demand times, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of money to be saved and a lot of carbon to be offset. Yeah. If it, like Darren just said, if you, if you look at the way the power companies forecast for these changes, let's say that power production for a city varies from, I don't know, 95 units energy to 97 or, uh, or it's quite more dramatic than that. It's 80 to, 80 to 95, something like that. Like the, the nuclear, coal, slow burning fuels make up the, the consistent bottom of the pyramid, maybe 60% of it. When you're left with that range on top, they might have four or five independent natural gas turbines going simultaneously when you only need two. But because the variability in that remaining percentage could exceed the capacity of, so you only need two units, but if, if power were to, sp to spike outside of the capacity of those two units running, the whole grid would shut down. So you have to run three, four, five to make sure that you're always above the maximum that could possibly be needed. But that's not efficient because you're not actually, it's like uh, running your get your engine at a stoplight. It's on, you might not be properly loading it, but it needs to be ready and hot and, and, uh, and running for it to be able to ramp up. If you could accomplish that same goal by sending out a digital signal to a thousand homes with power walls, and, say, and, and rather than having a physical gas turbine burning fuel and idling ready to ramp up on demand, instead you just have lithium ion batteries sitting on a wall ready to receive a digital signal. You need a megawatt, tell a thousand units to deploy a kilowatt and you have it. So I, I think that you eliminate that fuel burn and it's quite efficient. Be interesting to see when when that happens that they you know allow vehicle to grid i know that battery day is supposed to be coming up and it seems like they're making such leaps in the the life of batteries currently that at some point i imagine i don't know if you agree but the life of the battery will far exceed the car and at that point it can take the wear and tear of charging and discharging do you have any thoughts about when we'll see that in the timeline you know obviously it's important to to society at some point but but Tesla doesn't want to wear their batteries out unnecessarily, maybe. Yeah. Um, I don't think any of us know enough about the back end of their proprietary batteries to really be able to time it. 
well, but I think, like, I think we just said, I think they're on a mission to show us that the car stands on its own as a car in a cost-effective and reliable way. And I think it's the, the pitch to the mass market's going to come later and say, hey, did you know it could also yeah. do this? That's going to be the cherry on top that nobody saw, or most people didn't see coming. Um, it's, it's hard to say when that'll occur because it's uh, the more you use the batteries for load shifting and and uh, energy storage, the more you wear out and you'll, you'll shorten the lifespan of the car's utility. Yeah, so, um, start, so start off with proving that it's better at being yeah. a car than a combustion engine. You don't, you don't want to diminish, it up. Well, you don't want to diminish that narrative by having it do too, wear too many hats too early on and confuse people yeah. about the true reliability of the car. And also the virtual power plant model works by the same token of large numbers it's a lot less strain on an individual vehicles when there's more vehicles on the network to provide that load and with a more of a distribution because when that power is needed it's needed in a certain location so i think their whole pitch works a lot better if they get a lot of cars out of circulation first and then introduce the feature because if they do it with limited cars out it's going to put more wear and more extreme wear on the cars that are participating so I think it's in their their advantage to saturate the market with a really competitive car and then flip the switch and show people they can use it for power shaving purposes as well, where by the time they announce it, they'll have so many in circulation that I think the individual wear will be limited. Well, and, and, and it's, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, and, and the, it's so much cheaper for the, or it's going to be so much more profitable for them to scale the business with a lot of cars deployed because the same software rolled out over a million vehicles versus a hundred thousand versus 10,000, whatever the number is, but the bigger the scale, the more they can monetize this, the same R and D, whatever it costs, it costs them to write the software. And then in the outreach to talk to each utility and write the laws and argue, those are major undertakings and it's expensive a lot of attorneys involved with writing the laws of how to do this. It's a lot more, I think, justifiable for the, from their perspective to do it when you've already reached the car scale so that when you, when you say that we flip the switch, it's a multi-billion dollar business, not a multi-million dollar business. So the cost of getting there are a lot easier to justify. So I think the car first, but this is it's cool to know that it has the building block built in to do this next. So it's just a matter of time. Yeah, for sure. Very cool. Anything else that y'all would like to touch on or share about? Well, just, just on, on that same subject, what does that mean for Americans? It's not just that we're going to clean up, you know, the environment by offsetting dirty peaker plants and not just that we're going to, you know, save money by, by offsetting the cost of the most expensive energy. It means resilience. It means resilience in the face of, you know, weather, uh, you know, uh, the disasters, maybe maybe fires in California, maybe hurricanes in Florida. Maybe it makes our grid more resilient from from attacks, cyber attacks or otherwise. Uh, so, you, you know, there's there's a book called Lights Out by Ted Koppel that uh, really talks about how vulnerable our grid is. And if if we have that model where, you know, we have, you know, thousands of EVs around, uh, ready to power buildings and and complemented with residential batteries or you know battery plants um you know that that makes that makes us much much more uh resilient which which is which is which is a very important thing for for national security it, it also promotes us uh you know becoming more dependent uh from you know foreign foreign energy sources so you know this isn't this is this is also about national security and and, and, and strengthening, uh, you know, you know, really the economic foundation of, of, of America. Yeah, absolutely. When your energy source is on your roof, there's a lot less things that can go wrong in between A and B. You know, I'd, I'd like to think that, that, that going solar is one of the most patriotic things that, that somebody can do. Yeah, there's a lot of peace in mind. It's like owning your home. You own, you own your energy source. You don't have to, I mean, our, our grid's efficient from a cost perspective, but the power lines get blown over or if the plant goes down you sit in the dark when you have when you own it and it exists on your roof it's paid for 
all you have to count on then is the sun coming up and you have bigger problems that that doesn't <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so a lot of security and peace of mind that's what i remember you saying darren about powerwall was just the immense sense of peace of mind of having backup and knowing that you were going to have power never occurred to me how much i needed it until i had it mm-hmm. i'd say it's like having <clears throat> seat belts installed on your car for the first time before there were seat belts nobody thought i knew these things but nowadays nobody would get in their car and not put on their seat belt that's what battery backup is like in your home second you have it you're like i don't know how to live without this you take electricity for granted because of how cheap and how readily it advantages and it's miserable the second it's gone yeah because <laughs> how many things require mm-hmm. yeah 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 yesterday i went up on the roof with some uh potential customers to show on the solar panels and we walked around the house in the air conditioning didn't occur to me how nice it is to have the air conditioning then i went up on the roof for 15 minutes 15 minutes mm-hmm. then i came back in and all of a sudden that air conditioning same air conditioning was so much better yeah. uh, it's, it's all relative I, uh, but I, we take it for granted, but I, I spent a little time, like Darren pointed out, working down in the Caribbean and, and one of the places I lived in with a lot of the Caribbean islands, the power comes and goes quite often because of the same issues I talked about with, with matching production with consumption are a lot harder to do on a small scale because you don't have as much smoothing. So when you need generator maintenance or if a power line goes down in the path, um, when I lived in St. Thomas, power might go out three or four or five times a week for a couple hours at a time, and it was hugely disruptive. I mean, think about how the world centers around um, business and, and education around the computers, and imagine sitting down to respond to a couple of emails. You only have two hours to work, and you really need to knock this out, and then pff, lights go out. <laughs> that's off the table, and you're just sitting in the dark. Uh, not that that's really as much of a problem here in Florida, but it's you, just in general to take for granted that the electricity will always be there whenever you want it. Look, that temperatures are getting warmer, the oceans are getting warm, these hurricanes are getting more intense. We saw what happened. I mean, we've had a lot of close calls the last five years. I mean, um, a lot, a lot more Cat Five storms than I ever remember in the past. And it's not another storms aren't getting more frequent. But I remember growing up. I always lived in Florida, and, and uh, I mean, Hurricane Andrew was the big storm that people talked about for how many years? And that was the only cat five okay. storm I could remember for most of my childhood. Yep. And nowadays, I mean, what, last five years, there were six or seven of them? I mean, luckily, um, the U.S. mainland's been spared from a lot of those. Puerto Rico and St. Thomas were devastated by Maria and Irma. Um, Dorian just absolutely um, it was devastating in Freeport in the Bahamas. We, I mean, I know Hurricane Matthew scared us a couple of years ago, but it stayed off the East Coast of Florida for the most part. A lot of coast calls, but um, I remember growing up when it was, it was in middle school, we had a couple of storms hit Vero. Category three and a category four, back to back though, in two weeks apart, who would have guessed that? Both made Iowa. <laughs> I wall in fall within like I think two weeks of each other. We were out, we were out of power for six to eight weeks the whole wow. time. Yeah. Wow. Well, there's nothing you I mean, it, there were two storms, two weeks apart. One was a cat three that I that soaked the ground and 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 softened a lot of the structures. Any power lines were dislodged, they'd been blown in one direction, they hadn't been properly reset. And two weeks later, another one came through and knocked everything really off. Uh where it came home, all the, the glass doors had blown open. There was sand in all the every room, and the walls were soaked. Uh, and no electricity. Uh, it wasn't fun. So luckily, <laughs> we've been we've been we've been blessed for a lot of years not to, I think, had the widespread outage here. And, this, and, and the utilities have done a good job getting us back up and running. But who knows if that stays consistent? If we start getting if we actually start hitting, having some of these major storms make landfall more often, it could be a major inconvenience at, the, at best for weeks at a time. And if you can afford to produce your own electricity on your house, a lot of times the PV is cheaper than the utility to begin with. But if, if you can afford to do it, it's peace of mind to know mm-hmm. that 
your family can stay in your own house and have your refrigerator, not have to, all the pain too of every hurricane evacuation, having to worry about emptying out the refrigerator, buying the gas canisters, participating in the eight hour evacuation. Was it, was it a couple of years ago? Uh, what was that hurricane? We drove all the way to we, Irma. Yeah, was that Irma? Yeah, yeah, it was Irma. Yeah, we went. We 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 were planning to go to uh, Vegas for Solar Power International Solar Convention. We all had flights. Well, I think we had flights. Joe was already planning to drive to New Orleans for like a bachelor party or wedding or something. Mm -hmm. um, well, 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 me and another uh, another uh, a coworker that, that was working with us back then. Uh, we're, we're planning on flying, and then that flight got delayed or canceled. That flight got delayed or canceled. That flight got until there was just no more flights. And so it was clear to us that the only way that we can uh, get to Vegas was to drive up to New Orleans and then fly out with Joe. And we rented a Ford hybrid something or another, which was like a 70 miles to the gallon because it was a range extended electric vehicle. Because not only were there no flights, there was plastic bags on all the gas pumps. Yeah, because now everybody's filling up their cars, filling up their generators, getting on the road. You know? yeah. so really, by the skin of our teeth, we, we were able to get out and, uh, and, and made it to, to New Orleans and then, and then made it to, to Solar, uh, Solar Power International. But Hurricane, Hurricane Irma was the, you know, then a major thing that we had to deal with while, while we had solar projects all, all scattered throughout the state. And I remember we didn't know where we were to come back to. I mean, you parked your car on like the third story of a parking garage, hoping it wouldn't flood. Yeah. And we were, we had all the materials stored and in, and, and, and the communication back home was just hopefully we don't get hit too hard and we can get back and going, but we didn't know. And that, and that concern happens every year for three or four months out of the year. We, we always have that ever present question mark of, Will nature throw us a curveball and shut us down for a month or two? Hasn't managed it pretty well, but it's an ever present risk for all of us. Yeah, we saw that with the hurricane scientist we spoke to a month or so ago who was showing us basically one of the takeaways was just a lot of it is just luck that we haven't had a big a big strike um, in South Florida and um, and so um, would not be unlikely that we would see more of that in the future. So. Oh. But yeah, great, great reason to explore getting battery back up and being energy independent for sure. Something that you don't think about until, until you're in the middle of a crisis, you know? Well, also, if you, if you have, if you have trusses for, for your home, solar rules structurally reinforce the house. We saw that in, uh, I want to say Hurricane Michael, where we had a system installed in, in uh, the Panhandle of Florida. Yeah. And this customer of ours was like the only house that was livable in, in his entire city because yeah. the solar array structurally wow. reinforced the whole house. Yeah. You can imagine it, the, if the, the trusses run vertically and the aluminum racking runs perpendicular to that, it ties it together and kind of a, a grid to distribute the load a little bit better. I've seen that a few places. We've got, a, we've got a photos from a couple of different hurricanes. Uh, I've got a cul-de-sac, we've got an aerial photo in St. Thomas where um, there were six or seven systems installed in a neighborhood of like 12 houses around a cul-de-sac, I think it was. And every house that had solar still had the roof on. Every house that did not have solar did not. And it, it was just a stark wow. contrast looking down the street with the, I mean, it, they were contributing factors. The the con primary construction style down there was galvanized roofs nailed to um, directly to these huge like two by 10, two by 12 joists that were sunk into concrete walls. So the joists weren't going anywhere. The uh, structural attachment from the solar panels held the, I mean, held the roofs on too. So I think that, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm going off track. But uh, no, just a couple of examples we've seen real life of uh, homes with solar panels faring well or faring better than some of the neighboring structures. Because I remember that was one of the first questions we used to be asked in the early days was, well, what happens in a storm? So well, panels are designed to be left in the condition they're installed and will actually reinforce the roof. It's not gonna weaken your home, it's gonna make it stronger. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's a lot of good info. Um, anything else y'all would like to add before we wrap up today? We covered a lot of ground. And we I got enough to look yeah, forward to the next decade or two. Been a great yeah, for sure. Love what we're doing here. A great community. And I can't thank our customers enough for supporting us. And we just want to take that and take it to the next level. We're going to keep working and work harder every day. And hopefully we can bring this to some more people and keep doing some good in the world. Well, thank you guys for taking time today. I know you're both very busy running a company, but um, very cool to get your thoughts on these topics. Um, thank you to Elliot, who is our behind the scenes streamer who is taking care of all the technical stuff to make sure this comes out clean um thank you joe thank you darren my name is dane this has been fridays with darren and we will see you next friday bye, -bye.